good afternoon, folks. I'm Luke Swetland with the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History and Sea Center, and I'm delighted to welcome you today to this second Lunch and Learn webinar of 2023 presented by the museum's Plan Giving Advisory Council. For over 100 years, the museum has been committed to education in all its forms, and we're pleased to offer a wide variety of programs to the community at no cost, including today's Lunch and Learn about how to make life insurance work for you. Before we get started, I wanted to share a little bit about what's happening this summer at the museum and the Sea Center. So we just opened a fantastic exhibit of Charlie Harper's artwork, Curious by Nature, in our courtyard gallery. Now you may not recognize Charlie's name, but you will instantly recognize the delightful nature-themed graphic art he did over a very long career. Butterflies Alive is open in the Sprague Butterfly Pavilion with over two dozen subtropical species to delight you. Be sure and come on a sunny day and they're very, very active. In our Maximus Art Gallery, the exhibition drawn by a lady continues through July 10th, so don't miss it before it closes. And of course, the Sea Center on Stearns Wharf is open seven days a week with many ocean ambassadors that you can view and many that you can touch. So there's lots of great things to see and do this summer, and I hope you take advantage of all the museum and the Sea Center has to offer, starting with our program right now. So to get us going, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, the museum's legacy giving officer, Andrea McFarling. Andrea? Thank you, Luke. I appreciate the introduction. Good afternoon. I'm Andrea McFarling, the Santa Barbara's Museum of Natural History's Philanthropy Officer of Legacy Giving. We are happy to share with you this free webinar with helpful information on the aspects of life insurance in your estate plans. Today's webinar will start with a presentation by Brad Teasdale. Time has been allotted at the end for questions. Please place your questions in the chat when you see what you'll see at the bottom of your screen. And if you should have any technical issues during today's webinar, please email Allie Nygaard. This email will be added into the chat as well. Uh, feel free to reach out to me if you have any plan giving questions or need more information. I am here to help you leave your legacy and hopefully you will keep the museum in mind in your planning. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker, Brad Teasdale. Brad is an independent insurance agent who works with individuals and business owners. He is certified by the Corporation for Long-Term Care and the Institute of Business and Finance. Before starting Teasdale Insurance and Estate Services, Brad worked as the Director of Insurance Services at Mission Wealth Management. He started his career as a long-term care insurance specialist and was vice president at Long-Term Preferred Care, a national marketing and research firm for long-term care. Through proper planning and the use of customized insurance solutions, Brad helps people maintain control of their finances, preserve wealth, and protect their families. Brad, thank you so much for speaking with us today. I turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Luke and Andrea, and uh, everyone that's in attendance for this opportunity to come share a little bit uh, with you, and, and hopefully we'll have some uh, takeaway and a little bit deeper knowledge of, of life insurance and uh, some of the different applications for it. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, everyone to Andrea at the beginning of this, there's probably about 90 minutes worth of information that we're trying to condense into about 30 minutes. So I'm going to be moving at a, a fast clip and then we'll have time for question and answers uh, at the end. And I just, first of all, I just appreciate everyone who's online and taking the time to uh, learn about this, uh, this topic. So um, as uh, we get into this, and let me see if I can advance my slide here to um, just as we go through this and, and there's a lot of topics that will come up revolving, involving estate planning, perhaps some tax issues. And just to let everyone know, I specialize in insurance. I'm not a, a CPA or I'm not an attorney. Um, so if you have specific questions about that, I definitely recommend you go to those uh, professionals. So that's just my disclosure uh, right here. But I wanna start with just a general question out there. And um, 
what is the most economical and, and financial vehicle that's going to provide a specific amount of money at an unspecified time in the future? It's a rhetorical question because I know everybody's on mute, but um, the answer is simply it's insurance. Uh, in, insurance is a very cost-effective financial tool that's used in many uh, situations, financial, business planning, estate planning, and tax planning, as well as just overall uh, families that, that are planning and trying to protect their, their income and assets for their families. So we're using insurance in that context, but I also want to just talk about a little bit, why is it that we plan? Why is it that we do financial planning? Why is it that we plan a vacation or retirement planning? Um, and I submit to you that that one of the reasons is we're we're always looking for that predictable outcome, that predictable result. If we do X, Y, and Z, this is what we can hopefully anticipate. However, along the lines of doing that, if something adverse happens, we also do planning so we have a contingency in place. If something adverse happens, perhaps it's a, a health issue or a death before um, life expectancy some type of injury, whatever it might be, we've got a contingency plan in place to cover that as well. And oftentimes that's what we look for insurance to do is be that backup plan. So insurance in general, it doesn't prevent life adverse, adverse events from happening, but it does mitigate the financial, physical, and oftentimes the emotional consequences of that event when it does happen. And so that's why we build insurance in the different plans uh, that we have. So it's nothing more than insurance in general, it's just nothing more than a financial tool that provides a lot of leverage. We're making small payments over time and then when that, that adverse event hits, that's when we have a large benefit to cover that loss or mitigate that, that, that loss or cover that damage that's, that's caused. So that's what the whole purpose of insurance is. And then for today, we're gonna to talk more about life insurance in general. And there's a lot of different, um, moving parts when it comes to life insurance. So what we'll focus on in our time today is what are the different policy types that are out there and the different terminology that's in those uh, policies in life insurance policies. Then we're gonna talk briefly about what are the parties to a life insurance contract? Uh, what are the parties named in a contract and who's involved? And then we'll jump into some of the different uses. There's many of them, but we'll hit on a couple of different uses of why either individuals or businesses are using uh, life insurance. Uh, within their plans. So without any further ado, let's just jump in to the, um, the types of life insurance that are out there. And there is what's called term life insurance and permanent life insurance. And there's a difference between these, these two policies. So let's start first talking just about term life insurance. And term life insurance is the easiest and least expensive way to get a life insurance policy in place. And oftentimes what people are trying to do with, with uh, term insurance is just cover a liability or a financial commitment that they have for a certain period of time. And it could be they need some life insurance in place for 10 years or 15 years or 20 years. And, but after that time, they're really not gonna have that, uh, that same liability. You know, the house is paid off or the kids have grown and college, college, they've already out of college and we don't need that much life insurance in place. And so, Let's say, for example, someone's getting a million dollars of 20-year life insurance, you know, 20-year term insurance. Well, what does that mean? So that means from the day they get the policy, they're going to have a million dollars of life insurance policy coverage in place for the next 20 years. And during that duration, the premium that they're paying for the policy is going to be level. It's going to be the same premium year one to year 20. Now, that for that million dollars in this example of life insurance that they have in place. But let's say at the end of year 20, um, they wanna continue keeping that life insurance in place. Oftentimes people have either dropped or changed policies before the end of that term, but if they, they still can keep that policy, but what's gonna happen is that term that's been level for the last 20 years, that premium is gonna jump up. And if they keep it a year past that, then it's gonna, that premium is gonna jump up again. So that's why I say it's like leasing a car. It's very easy to get into. Um, you don't own the policy. You're just renting or leasing that policy for a period of time. But if you want to keep it beyond that term, that premium is going to jump up and up and up. Typically, the only reason that someone keeps a policy beyond the term is perhaps if their health has changed and they know that they're not going to be able to help qualify for a new insurance policy to replace their existing one. 
And um, so that's about 60 to 70% of the policies that are out there. The majority of the policies for individuals or for businesses are, is term insurance. Um, and uh, they have it in place for a certain amount of time just to cover, again, that liability that they have. But really, once that liability is no longer there, they either get out of that policy or maybe they've switched into some other type of uh, life insurance policy. So that's term insurance. And then the other type of insurance is what we call, oh, and as I mentioned with, with term insurance, it's uh, there's no cash value to it. It's just insurance. It's, it's just like your auto insurance, your homeowner's insurance. You have that benefit out there if it's needed, but if it's no longer needed, there's no other benefit to the policy. And to keep the policy in force, you do need to continue paying that premium year after year during that term. If you don't pay the premium, then the policy lapses. Some policies you can build in what's called pay a little bit more premium and have a disability waiver built into that. And what that means is during the life of that policy, if you become disabled, sick or injured, and you cannot work, uh, the premium will continue to be paid or basically that premium will be waived for you. So you pay a little bit more to have that bonus built into your, that rider built into your policy. And then oftentimes the policies most likely just have a, a additional benefit built in. It doesn't cost any money. It's called a terminal illness rider. And what that is, if someone comes down with a terminal health condition, it looks like they're gonna pass away within six months or 12 months based on their doctor's notes, they can accelerate the death benefit which means they can take a portion of that death benefit out during their lifetime to perhaps pay for medical bills or other um, expenses that they have. And uh, so it's based on, again, it looks like they're not gonna survive a certain amount of time and uh, they have that terminal endless rider in the policy. So that's a little bit about term life insurance. Now let's step things up and talk about permanent life insurance. And this is life insurance has a cash value component into it. And there's a lot of moving parts in this. And we'll try to get to some of them. And, and uh, where it gets a little confusing for people is there's so much terminology here where there's uh, universal life, guaranteed universal life, variable universal life, uh, index universal life, survivorship universal life. Same thing with whole life. There's whole life, variable whole life, survivorship whole life. So permanent insurance the effect breaks down in basically two types of insurance. One is called universal life, we'll talk about, and the other is called whole life insurance. What they have in common, though, to start with, is they have a death benefit, and that death benefit is really designed to be there for their entire life, all the way up to their life expectancy, whether that's age 90, age 100. Oftentimes you'll see policies written where the death benefit is carried out to age 125. So regardless of what happens or regardless of how long they live, there's that death benefit in place for them. So in other words, that policy doesn't turn out. The premium is going to be more expensive because it's carrying the, the, the contract beyond that um, 10 or 15, 20 year, like a term policy would do because it's going to be, it's going to be there for their life expectancy. So in addition to the death benefit, there's also an account value in that policy, which is the cash account value in there. And so what's happening as the, the uh, policy owner is paying that premium year after year, initially when the uh, insured is younger, more of that, uh, there's a certain amount of that premium that's going to be paid, used to pay for the cost of insurance. But after that cost of insurance, the balance of that premium is gonna be used to go into a cash accumulation fund. And as they get older, the cost of insurance gets higher and higher and less of their premium is gonna be used to go to the cash account. More of it's gonna be used to pay for their, um, the, the cost of insurance on that policy. But over time, the, uh, the funds in the cash account are accumulating and they're earning interest. So uh, growing over time, that cash account is growing and growing and growing. And that how it's growing is based on accredited interest rate, which we'll talk about in, in the next couple of slides. So in addition to the death benefit, in addition to the cash value, there's also something in a permanent life insurance policy that's called the surrender value. And what that is, is that's your walkway money. If you were to cancel the policy at any given time, this is what you're going to walk away with. It's gonna be how much of that, your premium that was paid in the policy, that's going to be refunded to you. Typically in the early years of a policy, uh, that surrender value is going to be less than the uh, cash value in the in the uh, in the account because there's going to be a penalty that the insurance company is going to charge you 
to get, uh, it really just helps them recoup their acquisition costs, what it costs them to issue the policy. But typically after 10 years, sometimes in a policy could be 20 years, the um, surrender value, again, your walk away money, if you were to cancel, is equal to the account value that you have in the policy. So that's what's happening. Death benefit account value, and you have a surrender value in the policy. So what's happening on that account value is it's growing, and it's growing based on a certain interest rate that's credited to the account every year. And there's three ways of setting up that interest rate, and this determines what type of policy it is. There's a fixed rate, there's a variable rate, or an index rate. And so what you see in a policy oftentimes is just a fixed rate. And so what that means is, where's that, where's that cash in your policy being invested? If it's a fixed account, it's being invested in the insurance company's general account. So it's a, probably a lower interest rate, more conservative, very predictable, which means your cash value is going to grow over time, but it's really not going to grow that much. And uh, But sometimes people like the consistency and the predictability of that. But some people, oh, gosh, if you got that cash invested, there's a way to, um, if you're looking at a variable policy, the stock market's earning a lot more than what you're getting out of that fixed rate. We can take your cash account and we can invest it in um, separate accounts, the insurance company separate accounts, so investing in securities or other type of mutual funds, whatever it may be. And, and the owner of the policy can make these selections and, and basically manage the cash, their own cash in their life insurance policy. So there's a potential to get a higher interest rate, a much higher interest rate credited to their cash account. Higher risk, higher reward potentially. But if what they've have it invested in, um, it goes negative or takes a fall, then they could lose money. So that cash account could lose money in that policy as well. So there's no downside protection. So higher risk, no downside protection when you have a variable interest rate in your life insurance policy. And so these acquire a lot more attention. You really want to monitor these um, year after year to make sure that the policy is performing as expected. So what's happening is if if you're um, if someone's looking at oh we have a a, a fixed account and uh, we know it's only going to be earning three four maybe five percent, you're probably going to have to pay a higher premium into that policy to keep that death benefit there, but with a variable, they say, well, gosh, we should be earning, we should be earning um, 12% on this. And if the cash value is earning 12%, you should be able to pay a lesser premium into the policy. Well, you always got to want to double check what is it actually earning and to make sure that you're paying a, uh, enough premium into that policy year after year. So again, that variable policy takes a lot of monitoring. So the other type of uh, account value growth you're getting is what's called indexed. So fixed, uh, uh, you have a fixed account or you have a variable account, and these are typically all done in separate policies or you have an index. And so what that's happening is the cash account that you have in your policy, that account value is really tracking the performance of a market index, for example, the S&P 500. And the growth in your cash account year after year is going to be uh, credit how that index did. And you're going to be participating in what that growth of that index did up to a certain capped percentage or uh, up to a certain capped amount, or you're participating up to a certain amount. So in other words, that index was growing 15%, and you're going to get 50% of that up to a 5% cap on the interest, or you're going to participate in 60% of that, uh, that interest that was earned. That's going to be credited to your account. The good side on those is there's no downside risk. So you're capturing all the gains, but if there's a loss in that index, it goes down your cash account isn't going to go down. So there's all these different ways of, of manipulating and, and selecting how your cash account and the policy is going to be growing. And this is where all the terminology and everything can get a little bit um, uh, overwhelming if you're not dealing with it every day. So, so that's what's happening in the cash account. And then there's two types of permanent life insurance policy. There's whole life and then there's universal life. So what's the difference? So I'll start with whole life insurance. And this is I just say this is the most expensive way to purchase life insurance. And the reason it's called whole life is that by age 100, the, the cash account in the policy is going to be equal to the death benefit. So you're made whole. So it's like a savings account, a poor savings account with a whole life insurance policy. And at the end of the day, say at age 100, the death benefit and the cash value are equal. 
Now, when you pass away, you don't get both. You get one or the other. Basically, you get the death benefit. You don't get the cash value and the death benefit of that. So that's what's typically happening in a whole life policy. And every year, the premiums need to be paid into that uh, whole life policy. And because it has such a, a large amount of cash value, that's where people will use this type of policy to be able to take withdrawals against, loan against the policy, to pay for college, to supplement retirement income, because it's, um, or sometimes they'll even use that like a private bank instead of taking a loan for a vehicle or something, they'll just pull it out of their whole life policy because they've had all this cash accumulation in there. What's also happening in a whole life policy is that that cash value is earning dividends. So every year, those dividends can either be paid out to you in cash, but most people use that the dividends in their whole life policy to buy additional insurance, what's called paid up additions. That, that dividends buying additional life insurance within the contract so the death benefit can be increasing as well as the cash value increasing. And as someone gets, the policy gets older and it's been enforced for a long period of time, there may be enough dividends in that policy that are being earned every year to offset the premium. So now that person doesn't have to make an out-of-pocket premium payment into that whole life policy because the, the dividends are earning enough to cover the cost of insurance. So that's some of the uh, what's happening in a whole life policy. A universal life policy is a policy that's also known as adjustable life insurance or uh, flexible universal life, adjustable universal life. So what that means is that premium is not required every year. As long as there's enough cash value in there to cover the cost of insurance, that policy stays in force. So someone may pay premium the initial years of the policy, but if something happens, they're not able to make a premium payment one year, they don't have to. If there's enough cash value in that policy to cover the cost of insurance, the cash value will pay for it. So someone could stop payments for a couple of years and then pick them up again. When they, have, when they pick up paying the premium, they'll probably have to pay more into the policy. But the premiums are flexible. It's never going to earn as much cash value as a whole life policy does. But what people are doing with the universal life policy is just making sure there's always enough cash value in the policy, as long as there's at least a dollar cash value in the policy and they're paying their premium, that death benefit is going to be in place. So when people learn, need permanent life insurance in place for estate planning issues, or they always wanna make something, uh, make sure it's in place, they'll use a universal life policy because it's uh, gonna be less expensive over time. Maybe they're not looking for the benefits of a whole life policy where they have that much cash accumulated in the policy. So again, I can go into much more detail about each one, but I just wanted to give a, a quick overview. So now when we're talking about um, what's involved in a life insurance contract, who are the parties to those contracts? Well, first of all, you have the insured, then you have the owner, primary contingent beneficiaries. So the insured, that's the person on whose life the policy is written. And when that person passes away, that's going to trigger the death benefit. Now, oftentimes the insured is the same uh, person who's also the owner of that policy. Oftentimes, the insured is the owner of the policy, but sometimes the owner is a third party it can, uh, that has an insurable interest uh, uh, on the insured. So that can be a, a person, that can be an entity such as a trust or a corporation uh, or a charity, and the owner is the one who has control over the policy and access to the policy. The owner is still the one that's applying for the policy on behalf of the insured. So you have the owner of the policy, and then you have the beneficiary of the policy. So the beneficiary of the policy is the person, the entity, or perhaps the owner that's going to be who's going to receive that death benefit. Um, and it could be again an individual, it could be a trust, it can be a corporation. Who's going to be the named beneficiary of that policy? Who's going to get the proceeds when the insured passed away? And then you have a contingent beneficiary. And that's the person or entity who's going to receive the death benefit if the primary beneficiary has predeceased the insured, or if it's an entity that's maybe that entity is no longer um, uh, in force, it's been dissolved. For example, if it's a business, then you have a, condi a condi contingent beneficiary that would step into the place of a primary beneficiary. Now, who can name uh, the different beneficiaries? That's the owner. The owner of the contract is the one that can. Uh, set up the initial beneficiaries, can make changes to the beneficiaries later on as, as situations change. If the insured on the contract is not the owner, 
the insured is not allowed to make uh, changes in the beneficiary or any aspects of the contract, only the owner is. So if the insured is not the owner, they can't affect who the beneficiaries are or make any changes. So those are the parties to the contract. So let's take a little bit of time and jump into where life insurance is used. What are the different applications for life insurance? And what I've got here is just a few of them. Oftentimes it's simply just survivor needs. We're just trying to protect the family. Uh, there's also estate planning needs where we're looking to efficiently pass wealth onto the next generation or create liquidity for income or estate taxes. Uh, divorce settlements is a big one, is where uh, if there's a divorce and you're going through a divorce and, and uh, there's spousal uh, support and child support that's needed, you wanna make sure that the person who's required to pay that spousal support, there's life insurance on them. Because if they pass away, that's going to, the, those, those uh, support payments are no longer going to be coming in. So oftentimes that's something that's set up within a, a divorce settlement to make sure that the, the person owning the, having those, the support commitments is, is uh, insured. Business continuation and succession planning by sale agreements is another uh, key part where life insurance is used. And um, there's also where life insurance is set up for really there's a death benefit there, but also enough cash value in the policy where it's going to supplement retirement income. And then, of course, we have charitable giving that life insurance can be used for as well. So I'm going to touch on just a couple of these, starting with survivor needs. And this is primarily where you see a lot of insurance used. Oftentimes, this is term insurance. And we're just so let's say you have within the family, you have the primary breadwinner, maybe there's two primary breadwinners or a primary breadwinner and then uh, someone who's uh, a non-primary breadwinner, maybe just doing homemaker services, raising the kids, taking care of the family. So if that primary breadwinner passes away, they want to make sure there's enough death benefit. They have enough insurance to pay off the mortgage, pay off any other debt that is there uh, to make sure that college is funded uh, for the kids, because they're not that income is no, from the primary breadwinner is no longer there to make that mortgage payment or to put funds away for college or plan for retirement. And you want to make sure that there's enough, besides paying off debt, that there's enough income that's being replaced to um, make sure that they don't have to change their lifestyle. You know, it's going to be a hot, much of a hardship as it is that, that that a family member has passed away, mom or dad has passed away. But now we don't want to have to move or sell the house because there's no life insurance in place to pay off the debt for the house. So we don't have income to pay the mortgage. So you want to make sure that you're not only paying off debt, but replacing enough income that at least for the next maybe five, 10 years, the surviving spouse doesn't have to go back to work. Then there's also a need for life insurance on the stay-at-home spouse because there's definitely an economic value that that mom or dad is providing by uh, taking care of the, the kids, running the household, doing everything that's needed. And if that person passes away, there's uh, that role needs to be replaced. You can never replace the person, but those functions that that person was doing to keep that household up and running definitely needs to be replaced, whether it's hiring a nanny, um, caregivers, um, you know, house cleaning, whatever it might be, that you want to make sure that there's insurance on that stay-at-home spouse as well. And so that's a little bit about survivor needs, just making sure you've covered that liability. And as I say, term insurance is used there is because you may only need that for 20 years, 20 years from now, 25 years from now, the kids are going to be grown. The house is going to be paid off. So you don't need as much insurance. So that's a good example of where term insurance will come into place. Another example of where uh, life insurance is used a lot is in businesses making sure there's a contingency plan in place to keep, make sure that business continues. So oftentimes people are, we have so many small businesses uh, in the United States that there's one or two or three or more business partners. They've set up and they're pouring all their time and energy and, and, and money into building this business. And at, the, at some point they want to be able to retire, sell that business, have somebody buy them out so they can keep maintain their lifestyle and move on into retirement. But before that happens, what if something happens, you know, what happens to the business and one of the partners or the business owners exits the business? Could be involuntary due to a death or disability or could be voluntary like an early retirement. So what happens to the business if one of the partners leaves? Well, if it's a death, for example, or retirement, 
you want to make sure that there's a, a properly funded buy sell agreement in place, because without that, uh, the, the say the deceased partners, if you don't have a buy sell agreement in place, and that deceased partner. The basically the surviving partners, they're not required to buy them out. They could just dissolve the business and start over again. They might have some goodwill and, and buy out the deceased partner's uh, uh, family, the deceased partner's family's interest, but they're not required to. So you have a properly funded buy-sell agreement that's set up. So what it does is it makes sure that the surviving partners of the business have first right of refusal and they have the money to purchase the deceased owner's interest from the family because they might not want the deceased owner's kids or spouse to come in and start working in the business, nor do they want the um, uh, deceased uh, uh, owner's family to sell that portion of the business, perhaps to a competitor. So the surviving partners, the buy-sell agreement gives them the first right to buy out the uh, deceased spouse's, uh, the deceased partner's interest. And the deceased owner's heirs, they receive fair market value for their business interest paid in cash, and the business is able to continue. So there's a lot of ways to set up a buy-sell agreement. I'm not going to go into the details of that, but essentially having life insurance in place to fund the buy-sell agreement um, creates that liquidity that they're going to need at an unspecific time in the future. There's a specific amount of money that's going to be available to purchase that deceased partner's interest. Oftentimes, businesses used to use term life insurance policy for this, and that's going to give them a death benefit only, and it's going to be very economical for them to put this in place we have just we have every partner has a life insurance policy on them and the and the proceeds are either going to be paid to the surviving partners or the proceeds are going to be paid to the business and then the business is going to buy out the deceased partner's interest you, they can also set it up with permanent life insurance and as we talked about permanent life insurance will have that cash value component to it and so you're paying a little bit more money to have a permanent life insurance policy but if it's a retirement, but have to seed the buyout for a partner that's retiring. So that's one of the benefits of having a cash value policy in there. That So the company doesn't have to rely on cash in the business to buy out the interest. They don't have to take a loan to buy out the deceased partner's interest. They have the life insurance, which is the most cost-effective way to do it. They've got that. They're paying a small premium over a period of time, and something happens. They know they have enough money to buy out that interest. So that's the use of life insurance in business continuation or contingency planning. So another issue that a lot of life insurance is used in is just estate planning. Um, and I know you do a lot of talks on estate planning and a couple of things going on there that can be estate planning is just looking to efficiently pass wealth to uh, heirs. It's also used to mitigate the erosion of assets due to estate taxes or income taxes. We also use estate planning for uh, equaliz equalizing an inheritance, especially for a family that, that runs a small family business. And maybe they have three kids and two of the kids are working in the business, but the third kid doesn't has there's no interest in working in the business. So two of the kids are going to inherit the business and that's really going to be their legacy. And they'll use life insurance to um, satisfy just because they want to make sure everybody's inheriting the same thing. And the, the kid that's not working in the business, they're going to be the beneficiary of the life insurance policy. So that's the way it might be used. Also used in uh, planning for special needs of a child or a grandchild when the, the parents or the grandparents are not going to be able to physically or financially uh, take care of that child when they're uh, passed away. So they've used a life insurance to fund a special needs trust that's going to provide for that child when they're not no longer there. Another thing we're just looking on to carry on the family legacy. Parents just are those that have life insurance in place just want to make sure when they pass away, the grandkids get something to remember them by or if they hey, there's a death benefit that's paid out and so you specifically to fund college for that grandkid. Hey, my grandfather passed away and he paid for my college, you know? So there's a lot of things that um, create that, that legacy that goes on. So let's talk a little bit about um, just using life insurance for estate taxes and income taxes and how that can be used. So currently right now, um, most people don't have an estate tax issue. If they pass away with our current exemption amounts, uh, for a couple, it's like 26 million. They'd have to have an estate over 26 million. If it's under 26 million, there's not going to be any estate tax issues. So, but that's adjusted uh, for inflation through 2025, but it's going to sunset either in the beginning of 2026 or it could be revamped if sooner, if, if um, before that. And so, where it used to be a number of years ago, 
10, 15 years ago, that exemption was only $3 million. Before that was $1 million, which meant everything above that, once you passed away in your entire estate, was taxed at 40. Sometimes it was earlier rates were like 55%. So uh, it's going to go back in 20, if nothing happens, it's going to sit back to about $6 million per person in, in 2025. And that could create an estate tax issue for a lot of people especially if they have high net worth real estate, commercial real estate, residential real estate, which is so expensive now. And if there's an estate tax issue, it's due in cash nine months after death. And a lot of um, the heirs may not have the liquidity to pay those estate taxes. So that's where they use life insurance. It's basically estate tax planning 101. They uh, own life insurance and an irrevocable life insurance trust. So they have a million or $2 million in an in a irrevocable life insurance trust. And that would be where the liquidity would be when the, um, the parents pass away, the death benefit goes to the insurance trust, that, that amount of money is not included in the estate and that's where they get the cash to pay the estate taxes due on that estate. Again, we can, there's so many different ways to set that up, I won't go into it, but oftentimes, and perhaps in the future, uh, life insurance and owned in a trust is gonna be a, a very cost-effective way to pay uh, state taxes when they're due. Another thing that's happened is um, with uh, what's recently passed over the last two years, the SECURE Act 1 and the SECURE Act 2 has really changed the way that inherited IRA is taxed for, to a non-spousal beneficiary. So a big retirement vehicle out there is someone's IRA, and someone may have a million, two, three, four million dollar in an IRA set aside. And it used to be when that IRA was passed down to not the spouse, the surviving spouse, but to the kids which is called a non-spousal beneficiary, they were able to stretch out the distributions of an inherited IRA over their own life expectancy. What changed in that is now the government said, well, really that IRA money, that's designed for the IRA owner's retirement. It's really not supposed to be transferred down as well. So we're gonna, uh, we're no longer gonna allow the inherited, this non-spousal uh, uh, beneficiary to stretch that IRA payment out over their lifetime, they have to take it out within 10 years. So it's all taxable money that they have to take out now in a short amount of time, which means that IRA money isn't gonna grow as much and it's gonna be more, um, it's gonna be more money coming out, more taxes. So if someone inherits a million dollar IRA and they have to take it out over 10 years, say at $100,000 a year, that all counts as their income. They're gonna throw them into a higher tax bracket. So there's different ways to mitigate that. And oftentimes life insurance is the way to do it. So one example is let's say there's an, uh, an, an IRA owner, and let's just say this is the husband, and he's got a couple million dollars of IRA money that he saved up. Maybe he doesn't need all of it for income. He's, uh, he's got a shorter life expectancy than his spouse that might be a few years younger. And so uh, he buys life insurance, and the spouse is either the owner or the beneficiary of that life insurance. He doesn't, he's taking distributions out of his... Um, IRA using a portion of it that he doesn't need for income to pay the premiums on the life insurance. He passes away. There's that death benefit there. His wife inherits the IRA. Maybe she doesn't need all that money to live on. So um, she takes that, that IRA and converts it to a Roth IRA. And when she converts it, there's income taxes due. She uses the death benefit to pay the income tax. Now it's a Roth IRA. And when that goes to the kids, it, they still have to, as unspousal beneficiaries, they still have to take that money out within 10 years, but it's all non-taxable. So it's growing tax deferred over time. When the, the spouse passes away, the IRA now goes to the kids and they still have to take it out, but it's, none of it is taxable to them. So that's a way of mitigating um, the tax hit on an inherited IRA. There's a lot of different ways to do that, but that's just one quick example of that. Charitable giving is another big use of life insurance as needs change over time. Someone, uh, the owner of a policy may change the beneficiary to be uh, 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 a nonprofit and to make a donation that goes in to that nonprofit. That's what the death benefit or a portion of the death benefit is going to do. It's going to go to um, a nonprofit organization. Now, when you set it up like that way, when it's just the, um, uh, the, the beneficiary is a charity, there's no income tax deduction because it's essentially it's not a gift, but that's one way of gifting to a, a nonprofit. Um, the other thing you can do is gift a policy to the charity. And Andre, I think that the, the museum was recently in receipt of one of those. Um, 
And with that, that goes, you now there's a deduction based on that. You know, you can, now they can deduct because you're gifting that policy to the, uh, the charity. There is a deduction on that. Um, and there's different ways to determine what that actual deduction is. Now, the, the uh, charity can, uh, when they're getting that, they can either keep the policy and there may be premiums that are continually due on the policy, which the, um, the, uh, the, the uh, nonprofit can continue to pay or the donor continue to gift premiums to the, uh, to the charity. So to cover those and that would be ongoing donations. But oftentimes the, uh, the receipt, the, the charity just may surrender that, that policy for cash and, and invest it or use it in one of their capital campaigns or ongoing um, funds that they need just to run the, run the organization. So there's a lot of different choices that the organization in receipt of a life insurance policy uh, can do. So anyway, that's just a few examples. I'm going to take a deep breath here because I've run through a lot of information in a short amount of time uh, with regard to life insurance. Other considerations um, before we get into questions, always review your life insurance because needs change, commitments change, and your need for life insurance change. Your beneficiaries may need to change. Uh, we'll, we should also talk about if someone has a term policy, they may want to convert it to a permanent policy, especially if they've incurred their health is different since the time they got their permanent uh, their term policy, and they may not qualify for another term policy, so they may, may want to convert the one they have into a permanent policy without having to go through medical underwriting, uh, which is another aspect of getting a life. Um, we should talk about long-term care needs, using a life insurance policy to pay for that, as well as life settlement. So these are some of the things I think will be addressed in the questions that we have coming up. So I'm going to stop right now, and Andrea, you might want to jump in and close this up. But thank you, everyone, for, for listening and thank you. some information that you can utilize. Yes. I Thank you so much, Brad. We really appreciate you sh sharing your expertise with us. Um, I do have a couple of questions and uh, wanted to start with, can someone sell their life insurance policy? Yes. A life insurance policy is your personal property. It's like an asset uh, that you own. So, yes, it can be sold. So I don't know if anybody's seen a commercial on television where there's guys underneath the house that say you're sitting on a gold mine yeah. or uh, there's somebody say we were, we didn't know if we'd have enough money to retire, but then we sold our life insurance policies. Now we can sit comfortably and they're a fairly young, healthy couple. Uh -huh. Yes, the life insurance policy can be sold and that's called a life settlement. And <laughs> The, um, there's a, a, a market out there for life insurance policies and you're selling your policy and getting cash for your policy. So if someone's premium has got too expensive to keep that policy in force, or they, they, are, they may not, there might not be that much cash value in a life insurance policy, they might be able to get more by selling the policy than what's in there, uh, but then surrendering the policy and getting that cash value out. But what when you're doing that, what the buyers of that life insurance policy are looking for is they're looking for life expectancy of less than 10 years. Because whoever's buying that policy from you, they have to keep making the premium payments on that policy to keep it enforced. And so they really don't want to be doing that for too long. So they're so when you're selling a life insurance policy, they'll they'll to see if it's a marketable policy, you'll run an uh, enforce illustration on the policy to see what exactly are the premium payments we're gonna have to make under this. And then they also do medical underwriting on the, uh, on the insured in that policy. And if they have a life expectancy that's 15 or 20 years, there's, they're not gonna buy that policy. If it looks like they're gonna survive maybe six or seven, eight years, yeah, then there's a chance that they'll give them uh, that policy. I had a, a gentleman, had a universal life policy, or it might have been a whole life policy that was kind of a blend of, of term and permanent insurance. It's a million dollar death benefit, and the cash value had gone to zero. And so, what that means is he had to pay a lot of money every year. He's paying like $25,000 a year to keep the policy in force because it had no cash value in it. He didn't want to do that, but he didn't want to walk away with nothing. If he canceled the policy, he has no death benefit, he has no cash value. So, and he was seven years old, and we were able to sell this for him took it to market. And because he had just been diagnosed with prostate cancer mm -hmm. and they were giving him probably an eight-year life expectancy, um, I was able to get him $250,000 for that policy. So he's going to walk away with nothing or keep paying $25,000 a year. Or so, or 
uh, take 250, guess what he did? Right. Took he the took the 250 and sold it. So yes, yes, you can sell your life insurance policy. Okay. So here's another question. How can someone use their life insurance policy to pay for long-term care? So uh, those type of policies are called hybrid long-term care policies. And there's a couple ways to set those up. And you do have to set those up initially when you're acquiring the policy. So one is, is um, and most often, except for one carrier, these are done on permanent life insurance policies. And so you can say, I've got a, say a $500,000 death benefit or a million dollar death benefit in this policy. And you pay a little bit extra premium, but what that's going to allow you to do is if you need care, it's going to allow you to accelerate the benefit. You'll be able to take 2% or 4% of the policy benefits the, of the death benefit out every month to pay for qualified long-term care services, home care, facility care, wherever it might be. And that's non-taxable to you. And uh, so that's one way of doing it. And if you never need care, you certainly got the death benefit in place. Or if you've taken half the benefit, death benefit out paying for care, then the remainder death benefit goes to your beneficiary. So yes, you can do that, but you set it up at the beginning. Now, other policies are long-term care policies that are written. They're, they're basically, it's a long-term care insurance, but it's built into a life insurance chassis. It's built into a, a universal life or it's built into a, um, uh, a whole life policy. It's really designed for long-term care. Well, the first one I talked is life insurance. Oh, and long-term care if you need it. This is really long-term care, some policies, but if you never need long-term care, there's a small death benefit that goes. So you're at least going to get something out of the policy. So, but you need to set up, up at the beginning and, and, uh, and figure out which one is going to give you the most value for the dollar. You want life insurance with also long-term care. You want long-term care, but it's going to give you some life insurance if you don't need it. You don't need care. So what if um, I'm no longer insurable? How can I insure someone else? Or what, what, what are your thoughts on that? So if you're uh, no longer insurable, um, well, one, I would say, let's, let's find out uh, if, if you are insurable or not, because you might just be uninsurable with one or two carriers, but that doesn't mean that no, there's no other carriers. So as an independent um, agent, I work with an, all the carriers out there. And so I'm looking at someone's age and their health situation. And I have, or some carriers have declined an applicant because their illness or whatever their health issue is, doesn't fall within their underwriting requirements. And I have another carrier that will accept them. So what you want to do first is you want to explore all options. So I'll I'll take somebody and work with a um, uh, basically a high risk um, a carrier, and so I'll work with a specific broker and say, okay, here's the situation, and let's shop the market and see who's willing to to bite on this. And you may have three carriers that say no and one that says yes. So I would ex first explore all options if you think they're uninsurable. The other thing is depending on if you're um, what is the need of the insurance? If the need of the insurance is, is not necessarily to support a spouse or a family member to die, but maybe it's really to have money go down to the next generation or to pay off a, a something. Look at second to die insurance. So um, let's say there's a husband and a wife or a partners that, that you put two people on the policy. One of them, uh, because you're spreading that risk over two lives, one of them can actually be uninsur uninsurable because the death benefit doesn't pay out until they both pass away. So if you have a healthy spouse and an uninsurable spouse on the same policy, when they both pass away, that death benefit is still going to be paid. So that's another way of, of looking at it. Good. Um, how easy is it to change the beneficiaries of a policy? And how, how does one person do that? Uh, it's the owner of the policy that can do that. And it's just a form. You just, put, you, know, you just get a form from the insurance company. It's a change of beneficiary form and you fill it out and send it in. Sometimes that can be done online uh, by the owner. Good. And you did but, mention that people should be reviewing their policies. How often should they be reviewing them? I would say probably every five to 10 years. And so if they have a permanent life insurance policy, you want to make sure you're just running an enforced illustration because when you're purchasing a, a permanent life insurance policy, there's an original illustration that's gonna say, based on this current interest rate that we're anticipating is gonna be accredited, you know, credited to the account value, plus your premiums, this policy should be enforced for this period of time. 
we want to do an enforced illustration and say, okay, now based on current interest rates, what's now being credited to the policy and our current premiums, you know, what's that going to look like? Is it still performing as expected, or do we maybe need to pay a little bit more premium into this policy or a little bit less premium into this policy? So as people get older, they definitely want to run an enforced illustration on their policy to make sure it's still performing as expected. And uh, and the other thing is, let's look at the beneficiaries. Who are the beneficiaries of the policy? Are, are they still alive? Do we need to make any changes? Um, so you just want to make sure you're reviewing the life insurance policy. And especially if the beneficiary is a trust, you want to review the life insurance policy and the trust to make sure that I've reviewed, um, help people look at their trust and the beneficiaries in the trust, one of them may be deceased already. And so that's going to, you need to make that change within the trust or within the life insurance policy. So always take a look at them. And then people's needs always change. Oh, we got a million dollars of 20 year term insurance, and now we're 10 years into that. And we think, oh, we need more. Oh, a million isn't enough because we've taken on more commitments. We've bought a bigger house or we've expanded the business, whatever it may be. So, your, as needs change, review your life insurance. Yeah. Yeah. So, as you mentioned earlier in your presentation, the museum was the recipient of someone's life insurance policy. And this couple found that their, um, needs changed. They had grown children. They initially got the, the policy when their children and family was quite young. Um, so the museum with the wonderful fiduciaries that we have did a illustration, mapped it out and determined that it was best for the museum to go with the cash value of the policy. Okay. So that was a fantastic gift that we recently received. Yeah. Yeah. Neat. So how does one go about acquiring uh, life insurance? Well, there's an application process to it. And on the application, um, you're filling out all your personal information, a lot of health information. And so the application gets submitted to the carrier of choice for underwriting. The uh, That underwriter is going to require um, typically you do um, a face-to-face -face interview where the nurse comes over to your house and, and that's scheduled. And they, it's like a mini physical in your own home. So they'll come in and ask you a lot of medical questions. You like a mini physical, height, weight measurements, uh, blood work, urine sample. Depending on the amount of insurance, they may even do a resting EKG, which will put the little tabs on you and lay you on your couch. And 60 minutes later, they have a little printout that comes out. And all that information goes into, your, um, uh, into the uh, insurance company. And when they do a blood draw, then they're also looking at what are the lab results coming in. That plus getting a copy of medical records and any specialists you've seen. So once all that information comes in, then the underwriter looks at it and makes a decision on yes to issue the policy. And then um, at what rate are they going to issue that policy? What's their health rating? Is it going to be preferred? Is it going to be standard? And there's varying levels of, of um, we, you pretty much have a good idea going in what that uh, health rating will be, but um, the underwriter makes that final decision. And then once you're approved, then the ball's in the um, insurance court to see how much of this, now I know what the actual cost is based on my health underwriting, and this is the amount of coverage I want, and this is what the cost will be. How do I want an issue? Do I want, I applied for $2 million of, of insurance, and maybe I find out that based on the, the underwriting that came out in the cost, maybe I only want 1.5 issued or a million dollars issued. So they make final decisions and get it issued at the end, pay the premium and it's in force. So. Fantastic. And if it, it, oftentimes if the insured, that is um, the owner of the policy, they're the only one that needs to sign. They're signing as a proposed insured as the owner. If there's a third party owner, like a business, you'd have the, the head of the business or if it's somebody else owning that policy, then they would sign the application as the owner. Great. Well, as you can see on the screen, we have both Brad's contact information as well as my own. So thank you again, Brad, so much for sharing their expertise with us and helping us think more about life insurance. Really appreciate your time. Oh, my pleasure. I know it's a lot of information and I probably skipped over a, a ton of material, but hopefully to kind of give you a, a little bit of a um, a little bit of information about the need and, and what's the best way to set it up for you. It's not a one size fits all. You're really trying to customize it to what your specific needs are and what your budget is to make sure you've got that proper amount of coverage in place. Yep, there's definitely lots of options and lots to think about. So um, thank you. And as uh, anyone is 
preparing, please feel free to reach out to Brad or myself. We are more than happy to assist in any sort of estate planning, insurance policies, or any questions you may have. Um, I would love to thank you again, Brad. Thank Luke, um, along with Ali, who helped with the um, background and the museum's plan giving advisory council for bringing these free webinars to our community. And we greatly appreciate all their time and um, diligent effort to make sure that important topics regarding estate planning are brought to the community's attention. The next free Lunch and Learn webinar is Tuesday, September 12th at noon, and um, Brett Parisma will be giving an overview on the role of an executive um, for someone's trust. So this is kind of going to be a really important topic to see if you have been named as um, a, an executor for, the, for someone's trust or if you have identified your child or your sibling to help with your estate plan when you pass away. This will give everyone an overview as to what those job responsibilities are. So again, that's Tuesday, September 12th at noon, and we will be sharing a lot more information as we get closer to that date on how you can register for that webinar. So thanks, Brad, and thank you to the Museum's Plan Giving Advisory Council. We appreciate the coordination of this presentation and thank you all for attending. Have a great day and um, good luck on in your insurance planning. All right. Thanks, Andrea. Thank Thanks. you. Take care. Okay. Bye, Denise. Bye. Bye.